Thank you, Russ and Marina. I'm also a very nervous presenter, so I always like to be with other nervous presenters. Or maybe it's worse, because then we all get ourselves more nervous together. But anyway, so thank you for that kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to present um, today on injectable opiate agonist therapy, specifically on the new guidance document that has been at last endorsed by the Ministry of Health. Um, to provide some sort of infrastructure for us to be able to expand programming um, locally. So uh, this is, it's just such great timing and um, it's nice to be in a kind of uh, optimistic environment presently in terms of offering a new potentially life-saving therapy more broadly at a provincial level. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll just mention that I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to declare. And I'll really be touching on the highlights of the guidance document. So the guidance document is approximately 70 pages. Um, it can be found on, our, on the website, the BC Centre on Substance Use website. So we can, we'll, and we'll send them out after today um, by PDF form, so you'll have a, all have a copy. Um, so point being, they're quite long and they can, um, they're, they're somewhat dense because they're there really to provide a lot of information for people who are, who are looking to scale up treatment locally. Uh, but the highlights that we'll talk about in the next 20 minutes um, are going to include how to incorporate injectable opioid agonist therapy as part of the continuum of care for opioid use disorder, how to evaluate patients, uh, whether or not to start them on injectable treatment, how to safely initiate injectable opioid agonist treatment, and I'm going to call it IOT just for, just for brevity, uh, and provide ongoing clinical support to a patient on IOT. Uh, consider patient safety and regulatory requirements for offering uh, the program. So the continuum of care for opioid use disorder includes pharmacological therapies, so oral and injectable treatments, and non-pharmacological <laughs> therapies such as psychosocial therapies and supports. I just will mention that there are two separate documents that can be found on the website. There's the Clinical Management for Opioid Use Disorder Guideline, which focuses on oral therapies, and then there's the, the new um, guidance document that's focused on injectable treatment that was released just this last month. So the continuum of care for opioid use disorder can be shown in uh, this figure. Opioid agonist treatments have proven certainly to be uh, the most effective approach to supporting abstinence from illegal or non-medical opioid use while also reducing morbidity and mortality. However, some patients do not benefit from oral opioid agonist therapy. For the care providers in the room, you can probably think of patients that you've worked with for some time who have not benefited from treatment. Um, examples for reasons why people may not benefit include having ongoing cravings, despite <coughs> optimal opioid agonist therapy dosing, being unable to reach a therapeutic dose for various reasons, or opting, patients opting not to initiate oral opioid agonist therapy due to previous poor experience such as past side effects, potentially um, being cut off the treatment, for example, in, a, in an incarcerated setting in the past. Individuals who don't benefit from first-line medications or oral medications, like other individuals using illegal or illicit drugs, face significant risks, including premature death, non-fatal overdose, infectious diseases, and involvement in the criminal justice system. And research has shown that among patients who are not successful on methadone treatment, injectable opioid agonist therapy administered under the supervision of trained health professionals in a clinic setting, such as at Crosstown Clinic, is beneficial in terms of reducing illegal or non-medical opioid use, treatment dropout, incarceration, and mortality. So IOT should be understood as one part of a continuum of care and treatment for opioid use disorder that incorporates the ability to intensify and de-intensify treatment over time, and then potentially intensify again. So uh, individuals can move along the continuum of care over time. Similar to other chronic conditions, so this is a continuum of care um, figure for COPD, which many healthcare providers are probably familiar with, um, and for other chronic diseases like diabetes or heart failure management, People with opioid use disorder may need to try multiple approaches and a varying intensities along the care continuum over time. So the role of injectable opioid agonist treatment is to attract 
and retain in a care a small but significant number of people with opioid use disorder who continue to inject illicit opioids despite access to oral opioid agonist treatment. IOT should be, should be understood as one part of a continuum of care in the treatment of opioid use disorder. As part of practice, IOT service providers should establish fully functioning referral pathways to addiction, recovery, and substance use treatment programs in their local area to ensure access to a variety of related services. These referral pathways include ways to support movement along the continuum of care, linkages to primary care, increased access to psychosocial treatment interventions and supports, and decreased barriers to oral opioid agonist treatment. Just a word about hydromorphone compared to diacetylmorphine. As was described uh, by Dr. Scott, regulatory challenges limit the ability to provide diacetylmorphine in Canada. Presently, these regulatory challenges are primarily related to the procurement and storage of the medication now that diacetylmorphine is available to prescribe via the Drugs for Urgent Public Health Need Initiative with Health Canada. Hydromorphone on the other hand, provides an off-label licensed alternative and is eligible for coverage through the Pharmacare Health Benefit Plan in BC. So hydromorphone is presently covered for those on disability, income assistance, and I believe people on Plan W, which is the NIHB transition over to Pharmacare Plan. We're focusing on hydromorphone today because of the relative accessibility of the medication compared to diacetylmorphine. Uh, that could change in the future, uh, and there is uh, specific guidance around diacetylmorphine uh, treatment in the guidance document that you'll be able to access as well. So this document, the guidance document, uh, describes three potential models of care, two established models of care and one emerging. The first is a comprehensive and dedicated supervised injectable opioid agonist treatment program. So this is the model that's implemented at Crosstown presently and that many of you have seen uh, and focuses uh, and is the focus of the discussion today as well. In regions with the capacity and the demand, a comprehensive model of care dedicated specifically to the delivery of supervised IO treatment for people with severe long-term opioid use disorder can be instituted. This may be a standalone facility or located at a hospital or other acute care center. In addition to attending the clinic up to three times per day to self-administer injectable hydromorphone under supervision, this treatment can be provided alongside life skills counseling, housing referrals, and other psychosocial supports provided by on-site care providers. And that Russ so articulately described benefiting from with the program um, as well. The second model is the integrated or embedded supervised injectable opioid agonist treatment program. In this model of care, existing community health clinics and harm reduction programs integrate an IOP program within the range of treatments and programs offered. So as patients may already be familiar with staff and services in the primary care clinic, the integration of an IOP program represents an extension of the range of programs that are already offered to clients. Similar to the comprehensive and dedicated IOT model of care, such as that at Crosstown, the integrated primary care model also fosters client and healthcare provider relationships, continuity, and comprehensiveness of care. And the emerging model of care, uh, an emerging model of care, and there may be more in the future, is the pharmacy-based supervised injectable opiate agonist treatment program that is currently being piloted in Vancouver. In this model, Primary care and addiction services are provided in existing clinics with supervision of IO provided by appropriately trained pharmacists at selected pharmacy locations. So patients are initially titrated in the clinic by their physician and the prescriber's office and then transition to pharmacy for daily witness dosing once on a stable dose. This is a similar model to how oral opioid agonist therapy is commonly supervised in BC like methadone and suboxone with pharmacy support. And then that primary care provider will make referrals as needed to ancillary services as well. So there are several criteria that will help guide the operational plans when designing an IOT program, and we don't need to go into them in detail here, but just something to note that there are um, things to consider when um, setting up a program uh, to think about. Uh, these include having a dedicated space for supervised self-administration, need for uh, health 
healthcare staff, such as an, a nurse practitioner or pharmacist who has the authority and experience to manage opioids under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act to oversee the program, uh, plan to di prevent diversion and manage attempts at diversion, a secure locked storage space for medication, ability to provide individually titrated patient-specific doses, capacity to observe patients before, during, and after administration, um, presence of an MD or nurse practitioner, uh, RN or RPN to provide intramuscular injection when clinically appropriate, plan for patient safety in the case of overdose, provision of access to the medication for up to 12 hours per day, so a minimum of three hours are required between doses. Most patients require two to three doses per day, seven days per week and a staff to patient ratio that's appropriate to space and number of patients, as well as ongoing and consistent access to prescribers to allow medication adjustment, and then the ability, which is so essential, to link patients to ancillary services. Moving on to the general considerations when deciding with a patient on, on whether to initiate injectable opioid agonist treatment, when counseling patients about this therapy, it's important to note that because it's a high intensity treatment, patients must be prepared to attend for supervised injection at least daily. Additionally, supervised injection has some limited options for injection sites, for example, not injecting in jugular or femoral veins in order to reduce the risks associated with any intravenous access. These are considerations up front. And when caring for patients on injectable opioid agonist treatment, a patient-centered medical management approach is important. Regular, even daily, informal counseling may occur, which will include a health and mental wellness check, non-judgmental support and advice, alternative stress management strategies, and referral to health and social services when appropriate. The relationship should be trusting, respectful, and collaborative. Staff should engage in a trauma-informed practice and provide culturally uh, competent and safe care. We should also provide recovery-oriented care. Recovery can mean different things to different people, but here we define recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and well-being, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. IOT prescribers and care teams should work with patients to develop long-term, personalized, strengths-based recovery plans, regardless of disease severity, duration, or complexity. When deciding if a patient would benefit from IOT treatment, clinicians should use their discretion in determining which pharmacological and other treatments for opioid use disorder have the highest likelihood of ensuring the goals of care. The goals of care include survival, reduction in the use of illicit opioids, and the least intensive level of care possible. So there are a few specific eligibility considerations that are listed in the guidance document to help guide clinicians in their decision making around eligibility. Um, I'll go through them here. I will note that there, there is a, f uh, it emphasized in the guidance document is clinical discretion. Um, every patient is different, and depending on the patient-provider relationship, um, a decision will ultimately be made. So these are some um, things to consider when working with a patient around considering eligibility for IOD. So the first is capacity to consent and fully understand the goals of treatment, uh, including the level of intensity of the treatment. So for example, that it, that it would involve multiple clinical visits per day. Uh, discussions around the risks of injectable opioid agonist treatment, which we'll talk about the safety considerations in a second. Requirements for uh, inclusion in the program, requirements for supervised self-administration. Additionally, patients should have a well-established history of injection drug use with opioids and severe opioid use disorder based on the DSM-5 criteria. Ability to self-administer via either intravenous or intramuscular route, the medication under supervision. And significant risk of medical consequences of injection drug use that would likely benefit from increased health system involvement and engagement in care. Uh, or uh, significant medical or psychiatric comorbidity. So examples would be HIV positive and not on antiretroviral therapy or, or, or poor adherence, acute hepatitis presentation, cardiopulmonary disease, severe mental health challenges, or multiple overdoses, um, and be at least 18 years of age. Additional considerations include current opioid injection drug use confirmed by patient report, signs of injection drug use such as track marks, 
uh, and documented opioid positive urine drug tests, at least two are recommended. Uh, there should be ability to attend the clinic or the pharmacy up to three times daily, so physically able and reside within proximity to do so. No co-prescribed benzodiazepines or Z drugs, and we can talk about this potentially in more detail in the breakout session. Uh, past experience with appropriately dosed oral agonist therapies and evidence of regular ongoing IV opioid use while trialed on oral opiate agonist treatment. Or multiple attempts at oral opiate agonist therapies without reaching therapeutic dose or successfully reducing or discontinuing illicit opioid use with continued health and social consequences. And again, we can go into some case scenarios uh, in the breakout sessions around, around that decision making and uh, should not fit criteria for an active moderate or severe alcohol use disorder or sedative use disorder due to interactions with opiates. And again, these are the more complex clinical decisions that we can, we can talk about in more detail. In terms of patient selection, additional steps to consider include um, talking with the patient's extended care network for individual situations and risks, so calling other care providers, potentially previous methadone prescriber, for example, for example determining the appropriateness of, of IOT in concert with the primary care provider and the OAT prescriber, um, pres prescriber patient relationship, clinical judgment and information from the extended care network really should be used to inform decision making prior to a start on um, injectable treatment. Uh, formulation of biopsychosocial treatment goals with extended care network, informed consent is required and a peer orientation is recommended. In terms of precautions or things to pause over um, prior to initiating treatment with a patient uh, include uh, history of chronic medical conditions, so examples include respiratory, hepatic or renal disease, acute conditions or recent head injury, youth or older adults, pregnancy, uh, inability to self-administer the medication due to either inadequate venous access in low risk sites or persistently poor injecting technique, um, not remediated with education. Um, and I should just mention that I, I, th I think probably many of these um, cases have come forward already at Crosstown Clinic, um, for example, pregnancy, um, and have been addressed on a case-by-case -case basis and um, can be discussed again more in the breakout sessions. So, but they're, they're, they're um, circumstances to think about and to consult a, a specialist on. An extreme caution uh, in the case of existing injection-related infections, so septicemia, endocarditis, pneumonia, infective osteomyelitis. So we do see this in hospital. If people are acutely unwell, we may not initiate injectable treatment while they're kind of undergoing their acute care for, for, for severe infection. Uh, or coagulation disorders, so patients prescribed anticoagula anticoagulants or severe hepatic disease or with DVT. And then always consider um, carefully drug-drug interactions, and some of those may be minor, and some of those may be more significant. For the, uh, once the decision has been made to start treatment, uh, the next step is planning for the titration process onto the medication. The initial titration period typically will take between three and five days, though doses must be titrated specifically for the patient in order to achieve a safe and effective dose. For example, Titration can be done over a longer period of time or done with lower dosing ranges based on patient's response or safety concerns. During titration, doses are continued at the, dose of, at the same dose or, or increased if well tolerated. If not well tolerated, based on pre and post dose assessments, the dose should be reduced. Doses should be titrated to clinical effect, such as cessation of illicit opioid use and cravings, while avoiding side effects such as sedation, opioid-induced hyperalgesia or narcotic bowel. Both the dose and the frequency of the dose can be adjusted as necessary to achieve this balance. There are no fixed doses for optimal stable dosing of hydromorphone for persons with opioid use disorder due to high inter-individual variability. So it really is done on a case-by-case -case basis with patients. The general induction protocol at each uh, dose involves the following. So administration of an initial dose, 15 minutes observation, uh, 10 milligram additional dose of no intoxication based on clinical judgment and discussion with the patient, observation for 30 minutes post-dose and minimum of three hours between the doses with consideration for an additional oral, additional oral opiate agonist therapy treatment such as methadone or sustained release oral morphine um, in the evening times as an overnight bridge. 
This is just an example. This can be found in the appendix of the guidance document, so it's an example titration table that can be used. This can be varied, but um, this is, this is one, one sample that's provided, and it's uh, not, I think, the current titration dosing regimen that's being used at Crosstown. I think you've recently updated it. Yeah. So there are, there are different options available. Um, this is, this is one, one example. And we can talk about that also more in the, in the uh, breakout sessions. There's also maximum suggested recommendations when prescribing hydromorphone iode in terms of how high to go and when to consult with a colleague or another specialist um, if, if getting up to the higher range in dosing. Once initial titration is complete, patients can be stabilized through further dose adjustment approximately every, um, every week, uh, preferably on weekdays, until the patient feels comfortable without cravings or withdrawal symptoms. There's no excessive intoxication or respiratory depression. And uh, there are modified pro approaches if patients are initially missing some doses during the titration process that can be accessed through calling an addiction specialist, such as through the race line or other expertise in the community. This is just an example of a um, pre-injection assessment tool that's part of the guidance document that can be used by healthcare providers to complete pre-dose and post-dose and can be kept on record. The dose should be held, reduced, or delayed in response to the above cautions if, if at pre-dose they're um, considered to be, um, have respiratory depression or, um, or uh, pre-dose intoxication. It may, however, indicate a need for treatment intensification if patients are repeatedly presenting um, with uh, pre-dose intoxication due to illicit opioid use. Uh, again, this can be more discussed at the breakout session, but it's fairly common to be prescribing um, in the evenings a low dose of methadone or sustained release oral morphine as a bridge dosing overnight um, because the medication is relatively short acting. Uh, in the guidance documents, uh, sustained release oral morphine is recommended over methadone as the agent of choice for that, be gi given its relative um, improved safety profile. Uh, and yeah, we can talk about that more. And when talking, when dis 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 uh, deciding on what oral opioid diagnosis treatments to use, uh, a lot of detail is in included in the guideline for clinical management of opioid use disorder, uh, which is available as a separate document as well as through the Provincial Opioid Addiction Training Program. So there are a few safety uh, considerations that are important related to injectable oat. Frequently administered injectable treatment is associated with higher risks of cutaneous and infectious complications compared to equivalent oral formulation. IOT should be administered in designated clinical settings with sterile supplies in clean and safe conditions under supervision of staff trained to intervene in the event of an adverse event or emergency. Note, this is compared to oral treatment. This is not compared to no treatment. Risks of injecting drugs that are purchased illicitly and used illicitly convey significantly higher risks of injecting prescribed, of, of, uh, than injecting prescribed iode. And just to give you an example of that, this is, this is um, information pulled from the Salome trial. Uh, one in 6,000 injections, there was noted po uh, respiratory depression post-dose. Um, all were managed safely, and this is obviously significantly lower than with use of illicit substances. And this was pre-fentanyl um, pre era. Uh, regarding infectious complications, for example, there were 18 adverse events out of 85,000 injections over a six-month period in Salome with uh, local skin and soft tissue infections. Um, which, and these can really be mitigated by sterile technique, which are, which are implemented in the clinical setting. And bloodborne illnesses such as HIV and Hep C are the risk is eliminated um, with use of sterile equipment in a supervised setting. So to ensure patient safety, after uh, 15 to 20 minutes has elapsed, a qualified health professional uh, conducts a post-injection assessment, observing any signs of intoxication. Uh, other patient safety considerations can be negated with dose supervision, uh, and also the potential uh, negative effects on public safety are typically avoided by reducing involvement in illicit drug use in the neighborhood, and supervised injection leads to fewer discarded syringes in the area. So we, we're really focusing on the patient in this guidance document, but certainly there's, there's community benefits as well. So. Uh, in terms of things to think about for the breakout sessions, we can talk about things like converting to oral opiate agonist therapy, for example, in the context of travel, prescribing in the event of missed doses, managing ongoing opioid use, uh, intensifying and de-intensifying treatment, 
the role of urine drug testing and prescribing diacetylmorphine. So all of these we can go into in more detail. Um, I'll just mention that in terms of educational opportunities for healthcare practitioners, uh, there will be on the BCCSU. BCCSU is facilitating an IOT module, it's specifically a training module that will be added to as part of the provincial training program for, for uh, addiction treatment support and this is expected by the end of November, so very soon. Um, and future opportunities for preceptorships and site visits for clinicians wishing to take on this work and expand current OAT practice will also be um, increasingly available. Uh, and this is just the cover of what the guidance document looks like, and you'll all be receiving a PDF version of that after today's uh, session. Um, and lots of other training opportunities you can check out as well. So um, injectable treatment's effective for those with severe opioid use disorder who have tried um, oral treatments. Health authorities are currently working on expanding IO provision. Two models are being piloted, including integrating into existing services such as a community clinic or harm reduction site and a pharmacy-based model. 